So I'd like to welcome Model uh, Bjorkus to come and speak to us. She is visiting us from Scarborough Baptist Church, which is a church plant that her husband Gideon leads and where she leads the women's and the children's ministry. She and Gideon have been married uh, and in full-time ministry for 31 years, uh, the first 10 of which were spent as missionaries in Lesotho. They have three children and five grandchildren with the sixth one on the way. Madal graduated with a BSc degree and taught maths and science, and she homeschools her children for some of their school years as well. So she's clearly very well versed in teaching. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for inviting me. I can just tell you that I'm very thankful this morning that my face doesn't look like a red balloon because on Monday I stepped into a bee or something and I was stung and my foot was burning and then Thursday my foot started to look like a, a red balloon. But fortunately, allergics works. <laughs> so I'm very thankful to be with you. It was a real challenge, this topic, and thank you, Rochelle. It was very challenging to learn about contentment. So my, con my topic is contentment in relationships. And how wonderful to be here this morning. And already I made three new friends this morning, Sharon, Sharon, and Stephanie, who's in our group. So it's wonderful to have relationships. And we love relationships. And relationships are good. And it re it's really a blessing from the Lord, but we must admit and acknowledge that there is sin in this world. And therefore, I'm sure there are many of you sitting here with broken hearts, with maybe deep pain or hurt, maybe a wayward child, or a relationship that didn't work out as you thought it would. Or maybe you have unwanted singleness, and it is very hard for you to cope with it. So our lives are really interwoven with relationships. We define ourselves by our relationships. And it is no wonder that when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law, he summarized it. He said the law and the prophets, the Bible, he summarized it in relationships. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the foremost, and the second one that is like this. You must love your neighbor as yourself. Twofold relationship. A relationship with a heavenly father and a relationship with our neighbors. Of what? The relationship with our Heavenly Father is by far, by far superior than any other relationship you may ever experience. It is an absolute privilege out of this world to be able to say, I am in a relationship with a living God, the creator of heaven and earth. And our relationship with God is also the fountainhead from which all our relationships will flow. And therefore, we can describe Christian contentment by saying it is a deep peace and satisfaction that you have to know that I have a heavenly Father who loves me and who cares for me He's on, in control of my life, and I submit to his will for my life. But now the question is, for each one of us, for me and for you, are you in a relationship with a living God? Did you confess your sins and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you love the Word of God and desires to obey the Word of God? 
So I will share with you my testimony because I'm in a living relationship with the Almighty God and I praise and thank the Lord that I'm able to say that. But let's pray, then I'll share with you. Our Father in heaven, may your name be glorified. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And thank you, Father, that we will not live from bread alone, but from every word that comes from you. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus Christ, our Savior. The Word of God and meditating on it is my passion. And as a result, I find the joy of the Lord to be my strength, and I find myself to grow in contentment. But it was not always like that. I was not born like that. I was born in iniquity, and my mother can vouch to that. I was red-headed, hot-tempered. And even though I'm very thankful to my parents for my upbringing, they couldn't give me faith. They couldn't cleanse me of my sins, and they couldn't give me the Holy Spirit, because we know by grace we have been saved through faith, not by ourselves. It's a gift of God so that no one may boast. My father was a missionary doctor, and I had wonderful childhood years growing up in a missions context. I was the youngest of four children, four children in four years, and uh, wonderful childhood memories. But when I was a teenager, we moved to a city, and our family struggled to adapt, and I especially, as a teenager, I was religious, not in a living relationship with the Lord. I was self-righteous full of pride, and I did not really understand why Jesus had to die for me on the cross. And after high school, I went on a gap year, and in a not a good situation, it was on the the banner of religion, but uh, it was openly immoral environment. And I, after that year, I was very confused disillusioned, dis- and disillusioned. And I started my studies, a BSc in math, because they told me, maths, I will have a job in teaching if I study that. And the wonderful thing of growing up in a Christian home, there are some habits in that household that you continue, and then as my brothers and all my, my brothers and sisters did at university, I, always, I also went on the mission trips of the university, and on one of these mission trips, I met my husband, Gideon. He was a theology student, and when I met him and we fell in love, I thought in him I found my savior, the poor man. <laughs> Lots of pressure on him. And when our relationship got serious, he told me, I must just know you will never be a normal pastor because he's called to missions. And I said, how wonderful, because I had this wonderful childhood memories. Any place, as long as it is not cold. (laughs) So he asked my father to get married to me, and my father told him, I just want to warn you, she's very difficult. But of course, love is blind. We got married in 1991, and he was called to serve as a pastor in Lesotho, and there we were off to Lesotho. Snow, knee-deep in the winter, no electricity, uh, no running water in the winter because the ice, the pipes are frozen, no technology, and I couldn't speak the language. And I didn't know my Bible as well, my Bible knowledge. I wasn't prepared for this mission work. So the rubber hit the road, and my wheels came nicely off. (laughs) And I must say, it was more, um, it's more the relationships that was a challenge than the circumstances. The miscommunications, 
the misunderstandings, and that caused me a lot of tears. But you know, the Lord is always in control, and how wonderful he is. He sent me a relationship. He sent me a spiritual mother. Let me show you her photo. I will show you. Let me first tell how we met her. So, um, and how I met her, it was in April. Is it now April or is it May? It's May now. And then um, unexpectedly it started to snow high up in the mountains like it always, also, always does. And church started 11 o'clock that morning and 5 o'clock that afternoon there was a knock at our door. We also stayed in a flat lit behind the church. We also. And I opened the door and there stood me Mamota Lele. Five hours late for church, almost frozen to death. And the first thought I had in my mind is, this woman has all the reason in, in the world to be discontent, to be upset. She's five hours late for church, and the, but the first thing she told us is, please come with me into the church. Today we must praise and worship the Lord, because once again he saved my life. I thought I'm going to die. My ears wanted to fall off. But the Lord saved me again. Let's praise him. Be and she also, because she had cataracts on her eyes, so because when you walk in snow, you get snow blind. So that was co caused her to, to lost her way coming from the valley where she was living. And soon we, we got to know this wonderful woman. And uh, we learned how she got saved. Ten years before we met her, when we met her, she was about 70 years old. But ten years before we met her, her daughter, while giving birth to twins, her daughter passed away. And the daughter's last words to her mother was, please, bring, take my children to church. And my mama Lily, she honored the wishes of her daughter, and she took these two children, a boy and a girl, to church. And taking them to church, she came to faith herself. And, the time, and then, when the twin girl was six years old, she sent her to school because my mama Telele surrendered her life now to the Lord. She had the love for the Word. She just wanted to read the Word. And so she sent this little girl to school to read and write so that she in turn could teach her grandmother to, to, to read and write. And that is... When we find her, she always came with an open Bible. And we always had to discuss. And for example, when we were reading about the Lord Jesus who said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, she will cry. And she said, my son who, gave, who built me the hut, he said he only wants his children to stay in that hut, but I want all my grandchildren to stay with me because it's my responsibility to bring them the word of God. And when you will give her a scarf, a new scarf, the next day you will see somebody else walking with it because somebody else might need it more. And I often saw her even being ridiculed and slighted by other women, but she was never offended. She always forgave and she smiled. And she always smiled, but not for photos because she had only, I think, two teeth and so she said she can't smile on a photo, but she always smiled because the children laughed at her, and she loved it when children are happy. <laughs> so she was a wonderful woman. And for example, you would also see her before church. She would come to church from the valley, and then you, she will walk around the church pulling out all the weeds so that it can look beautiful for, to everybody else. So we'll just quickly jump forward. She passed away in 2001 and at a funeral. And she was lowered into the grave. There was an outburst of praise and worship because they said she's now going to her father and her Lord whom she told us about. And then something that she does not know about, and that is three months after her death, a Sangoma came to the church and she came to Gideon, a Sangoma, and she said, Oh, here's a glass of water, this one, because I'm not going to use it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. So the Sangoma came, and the Sangoma said, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a follower of Christ. And Gideon said, 
What happened? Was it an outreach? Was it a sermon? And so she said, for 20 years, I observed this woman, my mama Talele. She passed my huts many times. She went through many trials and tribulations. She was always the same. Her God is the true God. So, but meeting my mama Talele and her being in my life, I used my Susutu Bible to learn to speak Susutu and reading with her and the other women. I fell in love with the Word of God. But still I did not really understand why Jesus had to die for me on the cross. My eyes were not quite open. But then the Lord provided another friend. And she's here this morning, my friend Jenny. She came all the way from Cape Town. She's there with a red coat. Put up your hand, Jenny. <laughs> So she came to listen to I up in the mountains and she spent a week with us and she trained me in child evangelism and how to evangelize, to evangelize children. And as I was preparing to share to children and how to meditate scriptures, I remember one evening I just started to cry and it was my time alone with God where I had to confess my sins my pride, my self-righteousness. First of all, I had to understand who God is. He's holy, 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 holy. Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come, holy. He desires a relationship with me, but I'm un unholy. I fall very far short of the glory of God. We all have been foolish ourselves. Disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pressure, uh, pleasures. Um, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our lives in malice and envy, hating, hateful, hating one another. But... When the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of things that we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit that He has given to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that was poured out into our lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and that is Titus 3. Verse 3 to 7. I had to realize how far I fall short, but how God loved us so much that He gave His only Son, that if we believe in Him, that we will not perish, but that we will have everlasting life. I had to repent of my sin. Jesus Christ came willingly, Son of God, completely man. He died, He rose again, He ascended to heaven. And if I believe in him, if I accept him, I can become a child of God. And if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive me my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So I had to ask forgiveness for my sin of pride, my sin of self-righteousness, pointing fingers to others instead of pointing my fingers to fingers to myself and I do praise and thank the Lord soon after that I was baptized as a believer and I received the Holy Spirit the love of God has been poured out into our lives through the Holy Spirit that was given to us the love of God and I can say that I'm very confident of this that he who started the good work within me he will complete it on the day of Christ but it is a hard work. It's a difficult work in this, in my life. And the Lord is busy working in my life. And I praise the Lord that he predestined me to be conformed to the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. To take up my cross, to follow him. To take my, up my cross, it means to die of myself. I must become less, and he must become more. 
Another interesting thing coming back to relationships is that these tools that the Lord is using in our lives to form us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a hard work. It's a great work. It took seven years to build the temple with how many thousands of people to build the temple. Now we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a great, it's a big work. And the Lord has his tools that he's using in my life and in your life. And so interestingly enough, these chisels and hammers that he uses in our lives are most often those relationships, those very difficult relationships, or the people, the women who criticize us, or who slander us, or emails that are written about us. All these things are the tools that the Lord is using in our life. And therefore, what do we, are we thankful for these chisels that are forming us into his image? No, we can say, thank you, Lord, that you taught me another lesson in humility. Thank you that you taught me another lesson in being unoffendable as a Christian. Yeah, praise the Lord, because we don't only exult in the glory of God, but we also exult in tribulation. Because tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope, and hope doesn't disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our lives through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So we are conformed to the image of Christ. Let's go to Jesus Christ, his relationships. Love the Lord your God with all that your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus came willingly to this earth. And Jesus, his father said of him, This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. No sin. Listen to him. And Jesus of his father. He said, the father and I are one. If you know the father, if you know me, then you will know the father. And I only do the will of my father. That is my desire. And when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, he was in great anxiety, anxiety that none of us ever experienced. His blood became sweat. Oh, oh, his sweat became blood. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, blood came out. <laughs> you know, then he said, Father, may this cup pass me, but not my will, your will. He submitted to the will of his father. He loved his father. His father loved him, perfect love. And when it comes to love the neighbor, you know, Jesus, we love to be defined by our relationships. Like, I know Sharon and I know Stephanie. They are my friends. But Jesus was said to be a friend of sinners and tax collectors. And he loved his enemy. God demonstrated his love to us that while we were sinners, God, Christ died for us on the cross. Jesus touched the lepers and he embraced the children. He had compassion on the crowds. He fed the thousands. Give sight to the blind. Raise the dead. And the good news was preached to the poor. He had compassion on the crowds and when he entered Jerusalem, he wept. He said, I wish I could Gather you, my children, under my wings as a hen gathers her chicks. He wants to protect us. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus, Jesus, our Savior. And then, when he entered Jerusalem, with his face like flint, entering Jerusalem to die for our sins, he lived. 
and died for our welfare when he went to Jerusalem. And the crowds called out, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is you come in the name of the Lord. And a week, few days later, I said, crucify him, crucify. And I put a crown of thorns on his head. I stripped him. They beat him with a reed. They mocked him. And Jesus, while being reviled, he didn't revile in return. And while he suffered, he uttered no threats. But he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And even on the cross, with the agony and being mocked, if you are the Son of God, let him take you down. Mocked, ridiculed. He said to the sinner next to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. And while he was in the deepest agony and pain, he even had compassion on his mother who was probably crying, he said, Mother, there's your son. And to John, his disciples said, John, there's your mother. He had compassion. Praise God. He died. He was buried. And after three days, he risen. The disciples, they deserted it, deserted him. Peter even cursed and said, I don't know him. I don't know him. Jesus knew that. He saw that. He told Peter it will happen. But what was Jesus' first words to his disciples when he rose from the dead? What was his first words? Peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And Jesus also said, he breathed on, him, on them and he said, I give you my Holy Spirit. Forgive others. If you give, forgive them, their sins will be forgiven. If you don't forgive them, it will be retained. Forgive. Don't harbor bitterness to the people who crucify me. Forgive them. Praise God. And we praise our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He loved perfectly. He loved his enemy. He died for us while we were sinning. But now um, we are living in this world and there is a spiritual warfare. And it is big. It's a cosmic warfare. And that is for your soul and for my soul. And for the souls of our friends and our children and our husbands. And that warfare is to make us lose hope, get despondent, be in despair, harbor bitterness unforgiveness. It's a spiritual warfare. And it's not against flesh and blood. It's against the evil spirits, the authorities. And it is fierce. So maybe you have to go home today and you will f immediately face a very difficult situation. Maybe you are in a marriage where your husband is unfaithful to you. Or maybe there's loneliness, unwanted singleness, somebody that passed. Or maybe a wayward child, and you are in deep pain and hurt, and there's bitterness growing in you. So now what must you do? Because I, the best advice that I ever got from when you have a wayward child is they say, the best 
way to exhort a wayward child better than any discipline is for him or for her to see the joy of the Lord in your life. And for that matter, any person who is wayward, any difficult relationship, those who slander you, those who persecute them, let them see the joy of the Lord in your life. But how? How? How do we have the joy in our life if we are so deeply distressed? And that is, and I want to offer it to you, it's a gift, the gift of meditation on the Word. Consider Christ, what He has done for you. Consider Him who experienced so much hostility from sinful men against Himself that you will not lose hope and despair. And uh, Bonhoeffer, there are two quotations that he said about meditating on the Word of God. He said, the first one Bonhoeffer said, he said, daily meditation on the Word of God as it applies to me is the crystallization point, molecules crystallizing, the crystallization point of everything that brings interior order and exterior order into my life. The second quotation that he said is, meditating on the word of God is providing the Almighty with a place of discipline, stillness, healing, and contentment in our lives. Discipline, first thing in the morning, stillness, a very slow, quiet advance, from word to word, sentence to sentence, chapter by chapter, stillness, healing. The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, sharper than a laser beam that they are using for operations, sharper. It penetrates between soul and spirit, between bone and marrow, able to judge our thoughts and the attitudes of our hearts. The word of God, bringing healing and daily. God wants to meet with you. First thing in the morning, before you speak to others, that is the best. Daily wants to meet you because he wants to comfort you. He wants to help you. He wants to encourage you. The God of all comfort, who comforts us in every situation so that we in turn can go and comfort, help, encourage others in the way that he encouraged us. I come to a close. I see my time is I'm quite out of time here. Just a very last verse that I want to, to share with you, and that is um, with healing. It is a beautiful verse, Psalm 31. And it is verse 19 and 20. And it says, Those who fear God, those who take refuge in Him before the sons of men, He will hide them in the secret place of His presence. Meditate on that. He will hide you in the secret place of His presence. We have a heavenly Father contentment. That is what contentment is. We have a heavenly Father and we pray to a heavenly Father that cares for you, that loves you, and that has your best interest in mind sub and we can submit to his will. And so therefore the challenge this morning is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This relationship is far more superior than any relationship you can ever desire here on earth and from your relationship with God will flow. It's a fountainhead of all relationships. And as Rochelle also said, I want to invite you this morning if you want to come and speak or if you need prayer or if there's somebody that you need to forgive. Christ has forgiven you and me of so much. And if there's somebody that we need to forgive, that we will also give that forgiveness to them. Well, if you need prayer, 
If you want to be in a relationship with the Lord and if you struggle or if you suffer, please come. Speak with us and pray for us. Or find a woman in your church tomorrow when you come to church and ask her, can I meet with you? Can we pray? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you. Thank you that we can call you our Father. That you care for us, that you love us. May your name be glorified. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for your word, our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Because to you belong the power and the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. Amen.